and I would like to uh, skip my introduction because I will inter inter introduce with uh, with the slides, and uh, I'm tweaking the slides actually. I I, I delivered uh, somehow related talk for the Java User Group Stockholm, and I said okay, and maybe I can I can it was different topic, but also serverless. But I said, okay, um, I would like to 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 explain why why the serverless. Um, and you, uh, Alex, your job is to challenge me and say I still don't got you know what you what you are thinking. And um, yeah, this is Perfect. this is the idea. So you are the proxy of all the all the of the entire audience. Okay. I really like Java. Actually, in my current project, I'm still using Java 17, and um, I'm just using Java. So this is uh, this is no diff, you know, to the last 10, 15 years. Java on the server, 100 percent, and on the client, sometimes 100 percent JavaScript. And uh, if I have client, if not, yeah, just Java. And it's still fun. So um, maybe uh, this um, my blog is the notepad. There is a podcast which rela related content and Ehex Live are the workshop which are on the corner. So uh, end of March there will be well attempt that is actually extension what we do right now with hands on. So today is a lot of talking because of keynote and then we can implement some stuff. And if you have any questions left, there is a free show the first Monday of the month. So it's going to be an, at the beginning of April. You can write your questions down to GIST, GitHub GIST, and I will answer the questions. Why I'm doing this? Because I am not answering any technical questions via email. So it's a huge time saver for me. But this show is running, I think, at, at least seven years already. And it's still well you know, uh, attended. So uh, thank you for this. And now, the evolution. So now I would like to introduce with uh, myself with some beautiful and colorful slides. So uh, this is not usual in my talks. So first, this is how I started. I started with Sun Java Web Server, the very first edition. I downloaded this from Sun Microsystems with my uh, and paid by my own credit card. I still remember 200 Deutschmarks DM. And um, and uh, why I did it? Because <laughs> I committed to a project where I had to implement a CMS. And my client expected me to build this with CGI, but I had no idea about CGI, no idea about Perl. The only thing I knew back then was Java. And I really hoped this this thing is going to be released. So I, I I got it like end of it was Sylvester actually of 1997 I guess, and I uh, and you know I hacked the entire night and then the ne next morning I had a hello world on screen as a servlet. So this was <laughs> my productivity back then, and um, yeah, but this was the starting of uh, of a of a content ma management system, one of my first uh, uh, server side Java projects, and I would suspect. Maybe one of the first uh, Java projects, maybe even in Europe, because uh, this was one of the first servlet engines uh, I got back then. So Alex disappeared, which is a pity. So, but uh, let's see. I think he has uh, other things to do. What I found is um, now he's back. <laughs> what I, 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 Alex, you have to listen. This is Keynote. You have to pay your attention to the Keynote. So now there, there is a Java web server. Uh, web page from Sun Microsystems. I found this on Internet Archives, and uh, this is really fun. Uh, write uh, once, run any um, anywhere without having to port old CGI scripts. <laughs> this was exactly my problem. So, um, and uh, but this page uh, already um, uh, says this is Java Web Server 2.0. I started with 1.0. This is older than this. And by the way, this Java Web Server already had a great admin console written with applets. I remember. So, um, and you can um, you upload, you know the um, the servlet and do something with it. The problem was, of course, uh, you know, there was no, no of course, um, there was no web XML because it, there was no servlet spec. So the servlets were somehow jars, you know, and, and uploaded, and you had to configure the entire servlet in the console. So there was no deployment descriptor. So um, I would say there was no clear separation between the infrastructure and the application code. Okay, then uh, everyone went crazy. EJBs, why there is uh, there are two containers. This was uh, very fashionable back then to have web container, uh, uh, you know, running in one process and the EJB container in other process. If you ask people why, you got the answer because of scalability. So there were like EJB clusters and uh, web container clusters, and they talked via um, RMI over IOP um, or uh, or Corba. And uh, back then, um, the servers, um, this, this yellow thing here is an application code. It's like uh, here we got, actually we got an ear enterprise archive here in the front end where we got um, the wars and here were the EGB jars. So if you think, uh, if, you, if you ask yourself, you know, what has to do with serverless, uh, stay with me because in the next few slides, I will show you the transition from this to serverless. And uh, Alex's job is, you know, to see whether, you know, the transition is logical. Now, the um, 
Yeah, what was the problem? I mean, the problem was never that EGB didn't scale or web container didn't scale. The problem was mostly <laughs> databases didn't scale. So the more load we started in the front end, the, 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 the worse it got, right? Because uh, we get transactions stuck in a table. This was the actually the main problem back then. Now, um, what happened then? Java 5 uh, introduced wars. And um, it was really easy to me to in 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 the companies to say, look, this you know the days of years are over. Now we have a war, and we can put everything to the war web archive and um, and ship no one 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 thing. And there was no more clear separation between the front end and the back end. And what also happened? So um, here the web container were usually struts, servlets, Java server faces, and this web here were most was mostly JAXRS. This is how it started. Uh, we got um, uh, REST endpoints, and they were somehow important because the REST endpoints, what they did, they um, they provided access to business logic for JavaScript apps. OK, so this was the early days. And then, uh, and by the way, at the beginning, JAXRS was not standardized. So we had to, 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 to use our own you know, jersey servlets to have JAXRS. So um, now, this changed here with uh, Java E5, 6, and Jakarta E. It was almost the same like this, but they say, OK, uh, CDI was, is, is actually one, and JAXRS. And uh, now we try now to replicate uh, the functionality of EGBs with CDIs, and we have JAXRS and CDI container. So now, what's with serverless? So I thought about this, why I actually like serverless. And what occurred to me, all the projects were always the same. There was one, there, there, was, there were no DevOps. Actually, at the very beginning here, it was DevOps. And I actually was asked by the company you know, to pick a server of what we would like to have. So we ordered the server, we installed everything on the server. So we are in charge of the entire stack. But I would say if the companies got more professional, starting here or even here, uh, there was one uh, the department who ran you know, the entire operations and you just uh, uh, copied your war over and they installed it. So actually, we never saw the servers, and this was completely serverless because we didn't care about the servers. And this is the entire deal. Why I liked J2E and still like Java E, J2E, and whatever EE is because I never wanted to deal with the particular server implementations. I say I learned the thing one micro profile once, micro profile whatever, and then I can deploy whenever I like. So this was the entire thing what appealed to me because before um, at the um, Sun Java Web Server Day, uh, between this and this, there were dark ages where we got 50 different servers which were completely independent, uh, independent, incompatible and independent and incompatible to each other. So it was really hard to, to, to create one app which run on two servers. So this was my problem. And I, did, I didn't have the time and the motivation to learn all the 50 servers and be good on all the implementations. And with J2E, I saw, okay, there is opportunity to me to learn it once and understand you know, multiple implementations. Now, okay, we have this. And then we thought, okay, why are we doing this? If the hardware is very cheap, so we get that. So one war, one server. And back then, it was like uh, almost seven years ago, I wrote a blog, blog post, one no, why not one, one war per domain? Why? Because I still saw clients, they try to optimize their deployments and put multiple wars to application servers, on application servers, uh, to save money. It's like, look, what we are saving is maybe 60 megs of RAM. <laughs> and, uh, and what we are losing is better observability, monitoring um, um, uh, robustness, because uh, the, you know, the wars are more isolated. And this was the beginning for me for microservices. So I saw a microservice, an application server, uh, which uh, incorporates, you know, uh, or the thin war is the application, the application servers in the infrastructure, and they were um, hardly separated. So there was no, you know, no intermingling between the Java E code or Java implementation code and the, and the application logic. So we had the clear distinction between both. And this is actually still recent architecture, I would say. But then what happened? And this was genius. I, I, I didn't saw this coming. This was the interesting part. This happened. We saw, OK, if we have this, there's only one to one relation always between the application server and the thin war. Why we are so strictly separating this? Because the separation here requires deployment. And deployment requires reflection, uh, uh, XML parsing, and, uh, and application properties parsing, whatever. What it means, it is slower, less secure, and more complex. And then 
the Quarkus guys, uh, guys came and say, look, uh, what we can do, we can deploy at build time. And this was genius. Actually, as I saw this, it's like, this is crazy. Uh, this is actually truly the next generation thing. And uh, uh, Quarkus and Micronaut were at the same time. The only problem is with, for me, Micronaut doesn't support the micro profile runtime and the micro profile is almost Java E and Jakarta E. So for me, it was the only choice I could use in projects was actually Quarkus because it was exactly this, what I always used in Java E and, and, and micro profile. So, and uh, what, what, what Quarkus uh, does, it, uh, it looks, you know, at the metadata, generates other thing up front. What you get is, is one executable jar. But if you look into the jar, this is the genius part. It is still separated. So you have one part is the application log logic and the other layers are, uh, are um, business logic. And this is somehow important because um, if you go to the cloud, so actually yesterday we had several uh, pushes to ECR, um, a traditional application. So the first push was uh, slow, but the ups subsequent pushes were very fast because we only had to push the, uh, the, the application code. So. And uh, Docker became the runtime. So we had microprofile runtime, mostly uh, Quarkus, um, and uh, the other servers work as well. But uh, what, what was nice in Quarkus was Quarkus is small. What it helps, so if you can save RAM, RAM is very important for on-premise uh, 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 deployments because you know uh, if you have uh, multiple servers and um, you, can, you can put you know, more, more workload to a server, but it really depends because uh, RAM is not always the problem. You also need CPUs. And if you if you look at this, you know, an application will need one to two CPUs. So you cannot put, you know, a hundred applications which require you hundred CPUs on one server and, and save RAM. So, um, but but um, I would say at least with saving RAM, you can run cheaper, cheaper on premise in your data center. Okay. And now what happened is the following, so I will show us in, in, uh, in, in a co code a bit. You could actually do the, exactly the same and swap Docker with AWS Lambda, for instance. This is what I'm doing in my projects right now. We say, look, um, why not you know, skip you know, the entire lift and shift and, uh, and go truly serverless? And the question is, why one would like to do this? And I would like to show how the code looks like and why it's so interesting. Alex, everything's crystal clear. You're paying attention to my great keynote, Alex. Of course, of course. And I totally agree with you that uh, uh, Docker totally met, made sense at that point in time where you, Very good. you can pack everything. Perfect. So now, F and Java. This was my first, um, it was introduced by Oracle at the Java one. And I was actually curious. And I said, uh, this looks actually interesting. And um, the only problem is to, uh, to, to ship a serverless function, you have to, st <laughs> to, to, to start the server first, right? And this is always the case. It's not like serverless, there are no servers. This is the, um, what serverless means. You as developer, you are not caring about your servers. This is the definition. And a serverless came out and it was everywhere. I was like, you yeah, are all stupid. I mean, we always need servers. You know, whether the server uh, works here or there, we have the server. The only thing is, if you have a serverless project, you, you are exactly what we did with, uh, with Java E. You know, you have the packaging, like uh, in Lambda is a zip, and in, and in uh, Java E was, uh, was a war, and, and, and you, are sh you, you are copying this to the environment and this gets executed. So, um, so FN project was interesting, and actually, um, if you are interested in it, uh, five years ago, I already recorded some YouTube uh, serverless Java with Java functions and, um, and uh, combining serverless function with CDI. So what is the problem with all these serverless? So, um, and or I did it already five, five years ago. Why I'm coming back right now to this and why I stopped no recording serverless videos? The problem with this is, in my opinion, it doesn't make a lot of sense to run your serverless workloads in your own data center. Why not? Because you will have to, to, to set up the infrastructure first. The infrastructure will have to run the entire time anyway. And then you are hoping that you are putting you know, more functions to your, to your, on the existing infrastructure that it gets, you know, you get something out of that. What is FN Java? This is actually the implementation of Oracle functions, uh, which or implementation is, I would say, the foundation of Oracle functions, which you can use in the cloud. 
So, uh, and um, so you could run it on your data center if you have a huge data center, right? This could make sense. If you, if you have a, a normal data center, I don't, I don't think it makes any sense. So, so what it means is I actually stopped doing this because um, if I have to run, you know, the, uh, the FN Java on, on bare metal the entire time, why I'm not just running my Docker container with my application server as you know five years ago? It would be exactly the same outcome, even even be, even better outcome because I am already thinking that Quarkus or the application servers would run more efficiently than the entire you no know, uh, serverless runtime. So, and um, what I never liked is this. So this is the uh, FN project um, uh, function, and what you had to do is. You always know this is the low-level function. You are you had to implement a consume body, for instance, and you got always an input stream. So this was like low-level fiddling, even worse. What I saw at CGI time, you know, in the servlet time, and now you know, ten years later, we get a terrible API and say, okay, but it scales and it's lightweight. It's like I don't care about your lightweight. I would like to implement my applications, right? So this was the um, FN. So I would just close the tabs, and um, and Lambda. Not different. So the uh, the lowest level lambda uh, AWS lambda um, function looks like this: um, implements request stream handler, handle request, input stream, output stream in context. So like my Java development 1997, even worse. Um, this is like I think it's called generic servlet. Um, I actually wanted to generic servlet uh, Java doc. I think this is or there is like the HTTP servlet and the exactly generic servlet. See, highly interactive. And the generic servlet, yeah, I'm uh, I'm very glad I got your cookies. But um, this is init log service. You see, this was like you know, you, you got the servlet request and servlet response. And in the servlet request, I could pick the my stream somewhere. Uh, this is uh, exactly input stream and output stream. So low level programming. I also was never interested in in implementing generic servlet. I always picked the HTTP servlet because at least I got the HTTP dispatching, right? Okay, so we got it. Um, this was Lambda, also not really interesting. So now, what I started to experiment, this is also a five years old project, uh, hugely popular, uh, two stars. So it, it took took off like crazy, but uh, <laughs> serverless EE. So what I did is, okay, what I at least would like to have, I would like to have dependency injection with CDI. And I would like to have um, something like JSONP that I can actually pass at least my JSON, you know, JSONP stuff and get back JSONP stuff. The problem I had back then is nice, but I still need the dispatching. I would like to have actually JAXORS and all, no, not only this. So I said, okay, this is everything nice, but uh, I don't see a huge benefit of doing this on premise. And two years ago, you know, the pandemic started and there was like huge explosion demands in the cloud. And I got, you know, got asked, you know, lots of questions. What do we do in the cloud? Lift and shift. Can we install Kubernetes in the cloud? It's okay if you have Kubernetes workloads running on premise and uh, you have no time, then just you know lift and shift everything and put it in the cloud. But with Java E, we can do better. This was the idea. We, um, we can actually minimize cost and make everything a little bit more predictable or predictable, uh, leaner and uh, and um, almost without migration. So this is what, like, what I would like to show you in a second. Um, okay, so back to slides. Um, this was FNM project. And now to the clouds. So this is the origin slide from AWS. Uh, this is like a management slide shared responsibility model. So this is the link. And um, where I'm going with it, this is like traditional EC2 deployment. The blue stuff are we developers and the orange stuff is Amazon. And uh, what, what it basically means, the um, Amazon cares about compute storage database of the low level stuff, and we have to care about the higher level stuff, but the high level stuff is not that high level. Actually, we will have to patch our operating system. We have to do whatever we did you know, on premise, do it again in the cloud. And I would say, okay, if we now have to go to the cloud, then at least we should add you know, added value. It's not like refactoring. We pick our workloads and do this exactly the same in the cloud. This is this you can always lose with such strategy because if you do exactly the same what you did on premise and you will do in the cloud, what will happen? I would say I'm pretty sure it is going to be more expensive without any benefit ex except if you are lucky and you did your database right, you get some scalability. And if you're not not lucky, it will behave exactly the same like uh, at home, and you will probably you know spend a lot of time with permissions and networks and security groups and knuckles and stuff like that. So. Therefore, if you go to the cloud, what I would at least like to have, or you know, to tell my clients, if we go, we would need to. I, I would like to have some benefit. 
And this is another slide from from uh, Amazon. Um, that there is, uh, I, I hoped there will be exactly the same, you know, diagram look and feel with some more orange, but no, I have to find something similar, which looks like this. And what this means is. I'm no more responsible for compute execution environment like operating system, no more for Java patching, nothing. I'm only do my security and my business logic. Say, so this sounds for me like Java E again. And this is actually serverless. So uh, the funny thing is, <laughs> this Java E monolith, and every, everyone said, you know, they are bloated or whatever, or whatever we heard, uh, everything is dead as, uh, since 20 years already hearing, or 20, no, maybe 15 years, you know, Java is dead, EGBs are dead and whatever. But um, the, the reincarnation is actually serverless, which uh, is interesting. And Alex, you have to listen and criticize at least one criticism. Say, Adam is not right, right? So this is, you, this is your job uh, for today. The, the last time it worked better. So... What means serverless? So, uh, long story short, first we don't have uh, we don't care about serverless uh, servers. So what I told you. So um so what it means is we only you know uh, uh, care about our business logic. What also important in, in serverless, this is for my clients is important, is um if I scale the thing to zero, so I shut everything down. But I, I mean, um, my lambda is is there, but it's not invoked. My database is there, but it's not invoked. So not like I'm deinstalling everything. The infrastructure is still there, but it's not used. This, the cost should be nearly zero. Why nearly? Because you know, a Lambda is, I don't know, 20 megs of RAM with the entire runtime if you if you ship it. And it, 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 uh, it is copied to S3, and it, it will cost you a little bit, a few cents, but um, almost zero. So... Um, the, um, by the way, uh, oh, I had also a nice conversation uh, uh, last week with a client, and it was a huge company, and they told me, um, so, you know, the, the, the AWS bill is just paid. So, okay, this is nice, but if you have no concerns regarding the costs, talking about cloud architecture doesn't make any sense. Because if you have, you know, a huge budget, then install, you know, the largest possible EC2 machine with hundreds of cores and terabytes of RAM, put everything on the machine, and it will run like crazy, right? So the, the, the entire cloud architecture discussion ma makes only sense if we care about costs. So if you say, I have the budget, I don't care, then, you know, install a huge Kubernetes cluster, put whatever you have on the Kubernetes, and it will run, right? Okay. Now, we have here... Um, no activity, no charges, cost-driven architecture. This is actually we spend all my time, okay, just profiling the bill and no <laughs> and no more heaps. Um, and um, architecture is highly depending on the cost. So what can have if you have you no know, a highly um, not scalable, how to call it, um, a highly popular service? It could be that Fargate is cheaper than Lambda, of course, because but there is an AWS cost calculator and you can do it. And what can even do? You can have one, you know. Um, and load balancer, and behind this, a lambda and Fargate, and 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 you know decide whether there is like a peak times or not, and switch back and forth uh, uh, depending on your costs, right? And um, high transparency. What I, what I mean is, you will see at the bill, you know, we build you for this execution time. This was the execution time, and this function was executed you now five times a day, or uh, I don't know, um, every two seconds. Okay, this is the serverless. And now um, Java. Java is special. I, I heard a lot like Java is not suitable as serverless. Java consumes too much RAM. The funny thing is you cannot buy, to my knowledge, CPU without buying the RAM. So in order to get more CPU, I have to buy more RAM. So for instance, my um, AWS Lambda function with Quarkus would run happily on 128 or 256 megs of RAM. No problem. But with 128 megs of RAM, this is the smallest possible Lambda on AWS, I get only one thirteenth of a CPU. And I question whether an, a, a smaller you know, app or microservice or function, is it suitable you know, to have a synchronous function which runs on one tenth of a CPU? So what we usually do, we add more CPUs. I would like to have half CPU or one CPU. And one CPU is equivalent of two gigs of RAM. And for, for Quarkus, two gigs of RAM is a huge amount of RAM, so I, 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 you can do whatever you like, basically. So this is this is the point. So you know, saving RAM in in on serverless does not always make sense, or or at least at in my apps never made sense. Um, you are paying for uh, gigabyte seconds. So what it means is, it's not like you can just you know uh, give the function ten gigs of RAM, which is the maximum you can you you can um, add because you are paying for gigabyte seconds. But what there is, you can actually tweak your function 
and uh, and 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 measure the costs. And my finding was on Java, two gigs of RAM is the sweet spot where you get fastest execution times and the cheapest execution. If it's less than that, what can even happen? Your function will load slow, uh, will run slower, and cost more. So th therefore, RAM consumption is less less relevant, and also therefore. This is not like we always use GraalVM or, or, or Mandrel. Actually, on AWS Lambda, we never used so far uh, GraalVM or Mandrel because you know the stock Coreto 11, which ships uh, with, uh, with Amazon, is, is fine. And I do have to do, I don't even have to ship Java. It is patched by Amazon. I only say I would like to have Java 11. And uh, whether it is Coreto or no, I don't care. But it is Coreto in the case of AWS. OK. And cold start, a huge deal. You will see the cold start uh, takes three to five seconds. Entire micro profile application cold start once, but if your application, uh, um, if your Lambda is invoked frequently, it will never happen again or, uh, or happen very uh, infrequently. And it only is relevant for uh, synchronous functions. For asynchronous functions, it doesn't matter at all. And the cool story in Java is the uh, more often a function gets executed, the more fast it gets. It's not like the function forgets the, not like it's stateless. The function on the end, entire function with the JVM and the entire execution environment gets reused and gets optimized by the standard Java JIT. OK, uh, now, this is the diagram from Amazon again, uh, you know, serverless best practices with Python. And if you take a look at this, this is also why I never liked actually uh, uh, the the functions in the beginning, uh, or why why I stopped using them is because I say I'm not crazy. I, I wouldn't deploy for create, read, update, delete, you know, for functions. I mean, who does that in our um, in 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 our you know Java tradition or history? I don't know, Alex. You also hack something. You would never deploy you know five applications to have CRUD with REST. We could do this, of course, but this is not our first choice. But uh, no, the argumentation is single purpose functions or whatever. It's like, I get it. But I mean, I, I actually, I'm not interested you know, in replacing get with another release. So I can update get, release one, but post is you know, uh, version 09. So I, I would like you know, to, to, to ship the entire JAXRS. And this is DynamoDB, uh, Dynamo uh, uh, Python. You will get the dependency here, right? Yeah, and a, a deployment hell, right? Because we have to think in which order to deploy everything. You know, the entire deployment process will be hugely complex, and we get a, a lot of deployment units. But if there is a mastermind who oversees all the dependencies, right, then it would be great because you can say, I can just have a huge system uh, comprises 1,000 functions, and I only have to know to deploy the single function, right? This is exactly the same strategy we can say, uh, should we upgrade you know, Linux more frequently and upgrade everything, or we just you know, will patch our ls command, right? <laughs> this is, this is the, uh, uh, the, the, the idea behind. But Alex, this is the first interaction we had, so we are getting there. So it's going to be uh, no, the 2% the of the interacti interactivity of October we already have. OK, now, why they are doing this? And my suspicion is because in Python and JavaScript is um, they are building smaller systems. So Python, you know, they are building commands, and um, and, um, and and if you think about this, the JavaScript was actually uh, many people say that this is actually not viable to build large system with JavaScript, and this is why TypeScript came because uh, JavaScript was not suitable for larger systems. So this is the thinking. Then we have to create smaller functions which are reusable. In Java, we have no problem of building build, uh, <laughs> large systems, right? So usually they are too big. But even a very small Java microservice is still a huge lambda. But this is what we are actually doing in projects right now, in lots of projects. So we are actually uh, migrating Java E smaller thin wars to lambdas directly. And um, yeah, and uh, what happens then? I mean, there are some limitations, of course, but if it works, um, it, is, it, it, it is cheap. And um, and uh, we have one lambda per microservice. Okay, so this was my Java function design. So from Java perspective, I would say uh, just create fat functions or oversized functions. This is the best practice. I wouldn't create you know one function uh, with get and one with post. And small microservices become lambdas. And if you and lambdas actually great. You can have uh, multiple versions of them and. Um, and they can talk to each other. This is actually like microservices. No, for me, it's no difference between a thin war and Lambda. 
And you can have GraalVM, so it will reduce your startup time by two seconds, uh, roughly. And if you have viewer modules, viewer projects, viewer movie punks, uh, uh, parts, higher productivity and maintainability. The last thing is, what we do with the API. So I said, okay, I always wanted to have, not you know, fiddling with the streams. I would like to have proper micro profile in Jakarta E and not like, you know, um, I would like to fiddle with, um, with the command. So um, another thing is, this is another uh, AWS documentation. If you take a look at this, this is a JavaScript function. What they are doing here, they are build a small calculator and they say they pass a command and depending on the command um, add, sub, multiply, diff, or whatever, they perform some operations here. And I say, this is great, but this is, imagine larger applications, so the switch will just explode. No, even a nice Java 17 switch expression will look ugly like hell here, right? So I'm absolutely not interested in dispatching, you know, the HTTP commands. By the way, I reviewed some TypeScript uh, AWS lambda, lambdas, they exactly did it. So it was like they parsed the HTTP event, and if this was GET, they invoked the method. So they implemented their own servlet by, uh, in, in the year, what will we have right now? 2022, I guess, right? Yeah, this is right. Um, okay. Now, now about the costs. Um, let's go to Frankfurt. So architecture. Uh, let's keep this is a little bit more expensive. So keep the Intel and this we can switch at any time to ARM. No problem. But uh, Intel uh, is more expensive request per second. So I think two two uh, requests per month is to, uh, per, per second is more realistic um, day and night. So we do this and um, let's say 200 milliseconds per request on average. This is way too much. Uh, but if you hit a database, it is realistic. If you don't have database is way too long. And uh, I told you two gigs of RAM. So then this thing will cost you in month $30, but this is the entire app, right? Now, this is the cost of Lambda. If you if you switch to ARM, it is going to be a little bit cheaper. So this is a 10, 15% cheaper. And by the way, all the Lambdas so far are running on ARM, uh, no problem. So now let's say with that, you won't ever have a cold start because it is constantly executed. So this is not realistic what we did here. And um, I would say, with cold start, the, the function would have to run, you know, less frequently, let's say one invocation per second, because uh, at night it doesn't run at all and we have some bursts. So you see that it will be $9. Dollar. And what I did, um, yeah, we have to skip the free tier to so do it again. Two uh, requests per second. This would be even more. I would like to have you the worst possible case per second. Duration is um, 200 milliseconds and two gigs. So now it will cost you 36 and uh, this is $29 because there's no free tier. Usually get the first 1 million invocations for free. Now let's say I don't like to have any cold starts. So with that, you won't get any. So my, what my observation is, if your function is not invoked for an hour or, or longer, then you get the cold start. If it's less than an hour, half an hour, then it just gets reused, right? So if so, this is already, there will be no cold start. But let's say we would like to eliminate cold starts completely. So go to the uh, arm again, uh, concurrency, one function, we would like to keep warm. And uh, hours, uh, okay, we need hours. Let's say entire month. Uh, th then we have 24, 24 hours, 60 uh, minutes, 60 seconds and uh, there are 30 days. So I would like to run the thing always. <laughs> this is a little bit crazy, but uh, yeah. Okay, why this? It's too much. 24, 60, 60. Ah, these are seconds. Okay, hours. Alex. I, I thought you 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 are you are watching what I'm doing. I was trying to read the maximum number, but I'm old and. Uh, no, this is twenty. The, I added seconds. It should be hours. Twenty four hours. Uh, twenty four hours. Thirty days, right? And this uh oh. Twenty four hours and thirty days, and this is seven hundred twenty, of course. So um, seven hundred twenty. Sorry. I think we can, 
switch to seconds in the right you see hours. yeah but this is 720 hours this is okay yeah. and the number of requests provision per month request per month this was this per second so we can reuse this duration was 200 milliseconds and two gig two gig so this will cost 21 dollar a function which runs entire time without any code starts so this is the cost. If you if you would like to have you know you never you know no code starts. This this are the costs. So it's a little bit. So I did it several times and it depends on the system. Sometimes forty forty dollars or whatever. But this is you know crazy. So it's like, okay. I would like to be latency. You know like ap application server running all the time. Okay. We had that. So now. Um, What we get, we can write more code. We get fast execution, somehow cheap. And now uh, there is a CDK, which I'll so, uh, uh, show you in a second. And we have Maven. And we have Quarkus and Micronode with a special superpower, which I also would like to show you now. So OK. So now um, there is a project. I, sh um, I think this is what I also showed you. In, uh, it's called AWS Quarkus Lambda CDK Plane. It's actually as a template. I use it in all my current projects. So this is not like, you know, hello world. It's just like uh, a usable template. And um, I updated on the, the AWS dependencies today morning. So you get very fresh dependency. Set up Quarkus. Uh, set up AWS. Set up Quarkus. Uh, and how to call it? DBUH, you said, like. DB, D uh vox what what was your twitter handle alex you have to look it up no you have to know it you announced that dbu uh day day vox days vd vox days vox days budapest uh man it's bucharest <laughs> perfect 22. <laughs> perfect i'm not sure about the 22 let's keep it this way i don't i don't know what happens with the numbers so uh okay okay very fresh. So what happens now? This is the CDK. And uh, let's maybe we do. I will just make it a little bit smaller. This is. So watch this. This is. Micro profile. I could use parts, whatever Quarkus supports. So micro profile and parts of Jakarta. E. So it actually looks exactly the same as 80% of all my Java e projects. No difference. Um, greetings with Jaxores. I have here hello and so forth. And what I could do is I could create here, of course, a nice uh, file and call hello uh, resource. And I think this one is already hello, right? Yeah, let's fix this. Uh, greetings is this one. And hello is hello. And this has to be application scoped, application scoped, and path. And this is hello. And I need a method. And the method is string. And it says hello. Hello string is not that. Return. Hello. The uh, Vox days Bucharest on UH. No idea. What it, uh, Bucharest and H is what? Hello. 2020 uh, now. Actually, it, it's the code from the airport, you know. Aha. Uh -huh. OK. It's, uh... Okay, but this is so, and of course hashtag. This is now hashtag. All have to use this hashtag, you know, to say we are deleting the servers. Everything is serverless. This is actually the outcome of this session. So we have hello, hello resource, and there is no dependency injection. But here I just use dependency injection on purpose at inject greeter with injected config property for property pro config property from micro profile. And hello, Quarkus on AWS for uh, Vox Bucharest, but you won't see this. I'll show you why in a second. So this is like stock Quarkus. If you look at this, no difference. So stock Quarkus. The only difference is this this uh, the dependency. The only difference to stock Quarkus deployment. OK, now CDK. CDK is cool. You need just 2,000 uh, lines of YAML. No, uh, just kidding. Uh, this is pure Java. This is the nice thing. And uh, we have here a stack called stack. And this is actually the uh, configuration here. And what I would like to do is I would change the name of the application. So Airhex, it is 
let's call it uh, voxed. Voxed uh, lambda not lambda. Let's do here. Uh, oh, uh, voxed days b u h. So, and uh, as you can see, the lambda handler. This is the trick. Is corcus. And what Corcus does is uh, it receives all the crazy streaming requests from the gateway and converts this to JAXRS calls. This is the entire trick. This is why I can use my old APIs. And I tried to build this with serverless EE five years ago, but I would say if I be build such an infrastructure as a developer, forget it. No, no one will use it. But Corcus did it. And Micronaut is also something similar. OK, I can say um, I would like to have you know, two, uh, 2048 megs of RAM in order to get one CPU. And um, or uh, let's say half CPU. Let's do the half CPU. Um, and um, this this basically it. And what is the source code? This is the entire deployment. I'm saying I would like to have Java 11. I know that is Coretta, but I don't care. Uh, I say this is my function zip, which uh, Corcus creates. Memory size, function name, environment, timeout, and uh, and this basically it. And um, this code I tend to choose between HTTP API gateway, which is cheaper. Between or REST API gateway, which is a little bit more expensive and actually outdated. But currently, if you have an enterprise uh, deployment inside a VPC, you have to pick REST API gateway. And for all other projects, we are using HTTP API gateway. And what is coming soon, actually, no time. Actually, it's already everything implemented. Load balancer uh, uh, solution is also working uh, already. No, at no time to open source that because you know Alex asked me for uh, for for the keynote and destroyed my schedule. So, but uh, just kidding. Okay, now, not true at all. And uh, okay, so what I only have to find is my terminal. This is the hardest part. DBUH, and I created a uh, script. By the way, what I showed you right now is uh, cloned from uh, uh, GitHub. So there is no secret source. If you do it at home, you get exactly the same experience. Build and deploy, don't ask. And uh, this will take one and a half mil minute. So I can see this. I'm curious whether it varies or not. I'm measuring. This is the very first deployment. Why it is so uh, so uh, uh, slow? Yeah, now because um, the um, all the permissions, the HTTP API gateway, the function have to be uploaded, and uh, and this takes time. And the subsequent deployments are faster. But this is the initial, you know, uh, WebSphere classic like deployment. So exactly the same experience. You have two minutes for coffee. Okay. So what should happen? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, maybe yeah, at the end. Sure. Um, how do you handle uh, uh, disk writes? Maybe you will uh, approach that uh, later. Disk. If you ha disk writes, maybe you have a program that uh, uh, writes something yeah. on disk. How would you do? No, that? no problem at all. The Lambda uh, supports EFS, Elastic File System, which is uh, VNFS, and you can write to temp folder, which is temporary. Um, I forgot. I think thirty max or something. So uh, this go, but this is like local, like like you know. Uh, instant store or uh, local storage on Docker, and you can mount EFS uh, file, and you get shared between uh, even lambdas and Docker containers. So you can absolutely write and read from from files. Um, what we we not doing this in my current project. We use S3, so the lambda writes to S S3 buckets and not to file system, um, and uh, it yeah, works perfectly. You, you have an older right library that does that, and you don't want to migrate. Then you can just do it. Then uh, you can you can have to um, if you search for lambda efs, then you can uh, do it. You look skeptical. It works. <laughs> <laughs> the folder gets mounted to to your function, and you can just say slash d uh, v v d u h, and uh, and you can have access to the folder. Okay. Okay. Um, this is my account. The function is already deployed here, voxed vdbuh, and uh, take a look on this. So this is the uh, API gateway with the function, and uh, we can go here to monitor, and this is the URI. So we can try the URI, and the uh, 75 seconds, the initial deployment. Um, time, let's uh, monitor the call start. So this is the very, I think we had hello, uh, uh, hello, right? Hello was the new one. Let's try the hello. So this is uh, early morning. And we got hello VDBUH, you see? Fresh from the clouds, from Frankfurt. 
And then uh, greetings was the another one, but this will going to be significantly faster. You see here, so we get 160 milliseconds round trip with, with a half of CPU. Now, if we go to the console um, and take a look at the monitoring here and logs, where are my logs? It's a pity, wait a sec. Uh, monitor. Huh. Demo, uh, demo then card. go to uh, CloudWatch. Maybe it, it, it takes sometimes. Uh, there are my logs. Okay. This is from now. So take a look what happens here. And you see that um, duration, the first one, was built half a second and we get built seven milliseconds right so my calculation and we have dependency injection two resources config property half a cpu execution time acht uh, acht is german how is acht in uh in in romanian eight it's opt huh opt it's like eight opt uh, opt yeah opt, like opt okay yeah. So opt milliseconds, uh, five milliseconds, five, five, five. So, and remember, the 30 euros I calculated with 200 milliseconds. So we are 40 times more expensive than actually, uh, or, or the planning is more expensive than this. And the very first invocation, we had three seconds cold start, the entire micro profile app. And then we got, you know, a, uh, no more cold start, five, five, five milliseconds. So we can try it again. And um, still no cold start, right? Um, yeah, this was micro profile microservice deployment as AWS Lambda. So where are the limitations? So the limitations are that the uh, that the uh, Lambda is executed in an, in a process. This is different to application server. An application server, you would have to you know the request scope are running in a thread, and the Lambdas are running in a process. So static, you cannot share. No, you you, you can caches don't make sense because you are not sharing you know this the static between uh between the lambda invocations and uh something like you know startup uh listener doesn't make sense a uh, micro profile matrix uh don't work out of the box because they are stored in in memory so it doesn't make sense you know they only work per function like per cluster and application server maybe one function is something like applications of a cluster this is this is the most similar thing so the only thing which works well is request scoped um or different Application scope. You can do every everything is a singleton. There are there is no concurrency, and the lambda is is, is invoked uh, entirely, and then you know shut down. And uh, startup doesn't work as uh, schedules, timers don't work, don't make any sense because the lambda won't wake up and ex execute the timer. But there is a great uh, uh, how to call it best practice or best practice a small pattern. It's called event bridge, where you get the crone and rate expressions which invoke your lambda. So this is the problem is actually solved. But you cannot do this in your code. OK, this was the um, lambda VDBUH live deployment of a lambda with uh, everything from scratch with Java CDK. Now questions to you, Alex. Um, any other questions? I don't know whether we actually finish with the slides. Let's see. So what you saw, uh, what you saw right now is oh Maven. I forgot to 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 mention this. And this mapping of HTTP events happened here. This was um, the idea here. This is Quarkus does this for me. So Quarkus, this is the function which is registered in AWS. Quarkus receives the data and invokes JAXRS. This is the entire trick. And because Quarkus is so fast, uh, Quarkus, as I told you before, it deploys at build time. The bytecode is highly optimized, so there is no reflection in place. So therefore, um, you can use dependency injection, whatever you like, and the Lambda still executes fast. And the cool story is I still don't need any external libraries. It's just everything included in the in the micro profile. And um, this is the CDK, and this is actually, um, and this CDK, Is shipped as a stack. This is this. Uh, so I have here complete control. Actually, what happened, which resources were created, and which events caused us to create. So there's the CDK. But the nice story is, this is plain Java, and there is a stacks, nested stacks, and constructs. And what we do in projects, we're not implementing everything here at once. We have one stack 
which does the VPC, the networking. Other stack does the buckets, the persistence. So they are layered um, on each other. And the cool story is, because it's Maven, you can wrap it in a jar and ship it to Nexus. So the teams can completely reuse the infrastructure without any YAML. And um, yeah, this is um, also nice. And this is called CDK Cloud Development Kit for Java. And I like Java. And uh, this is absolute no YAML. Um, and vielleicht, uh, vielleicht uh, maybe behind the scenes, if we go um, to, we have, I think, to Lambda, and I do Maven Clean Package, just plain. What you will see is that, uh, where is the other ID? Alex, how, how much time do we have? Uh, I think uh, we still have uh, 20 minutes. Is it 10, uh, 10, 10 minutes. Okay, 10 minutes, very break. good. Yeah, um, we have a question in the Q&A. Uh, what a sec, uh, very briefly, sure. what you see here is function.zip. So this is what uh, Quarkus creates for me. Function zip, no more jar. But now watch this. The most asked question in such project is how I test the stuff. The stuff. Do I have to deploy every time? What I can still do, I can say Maven compile Quarkus dev. And now I'm uh, in in the right folder. It's very important. And then it will run my Quarkus locally. And this is will behave like a microprofile app. So what I can do right now, I can open a terminal and say localhost 8080 slash hello. And I get this locally and greetings locally. So actually, I can deploy locally completely with my microprofile app. If it works, push it to the cloud. This is my work environment the last two years. So <laughs> this is what I'm doing. OK. And um, yeah, sorry, questions. Uh, yeah, I, I see a question uh, from uh, Stefan Volano. Uh, it asks if uh, Java EE is better for cloud application than Spring. Uh, with Java what? Uh, if Java Enterprise Edition, it's better mm -hmm. in the cloud versus Spring. Ah, I'm uh, Java EE. There is no such thing like Java EE. Java EE is just API. To run Java EE, you need implementation. And uh, the implementation could be Quarkus, parts of as a Quarkus supports, for instance, WebSockets, bin validations, I think even servlets, JaxOS, which are part of Java EE. So, and uh, Quarkus is newer than Spring, and Quarkus doesn't have any reflection in place. So the question is Quarkus versus Spring, or Quarkus versus Spring Boot, Micronode versus Spring Boot and Quarkus. And I would say, if you will start the discussion right now, it would be Flame Wars. What I can tell you, Quarkus and Micronaut are crazy fast. So watch the, you know, watch, go after the show and, and, and watch for performance, Quarkus and Micronaut. Micronaut is uh, a great alternative. What I see is that uh, the Spring people uh, prefer Micronaut because the API is similar. I prefer Quarkus because I like MicroProfile and, and Java E. And I also had in, in chat with uh, Spring developers, and they're also using Jakarta E, the APIs. It's not like you are not using JPA, right? Many Spring projects are using JPA. And JPA is a part of or bin validation, or you could even use JaxRS or Ed Inject was actually invented by Spring. So Spring is another runtime, I would say. And also, I think I'm 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 I have not a lot of experience with Spring, but even the behavior between Spring and Spring Boot might be different. Runtime behavior. This is my understanding. Mm -hmm. Okay. Very good. And, uh, and Anna yeah. uh, asks if. Uh, uh, do you try funky functions with Lambda? I don't know what mm -hmm. funky function is. Yeah, uh, I try that, but this is optional. Funky is an uh, is an um, uh, Quarkus uh, extension where you can use named. But uh, what I can do, uh... ah, not CD. Uh, this was set up. Very good question. From CDK and I think plain. No, Lambda. Wait a sec. I forgot actually. This was this what I wanted. What was the name of the entity? Uh, Hannah. Yeah, Anna. Anna? Anna Michael Chano. She Anna. Is our speaker. Yeah. So, and uh, Funky is working. 
And uh, what I what I can even do, you can start. This is uh, asynchronous lambda, and this is the CDK. Looks exactly the same, and the function is just that plain Java. So um, if you have asynchronous functions, you could use funky this f o n q y, or you can use plain Java. When to use Quarkus if you need more? Um, so what? What is the? Uh, okay, uh, this is um, Quarkus funky. We are talking about this now. And um, so first, so what Quarkus does? It provides you see the, uh, this um, a little bit more. Uh, how to call it? Um, syntactic sugar at funky at funk, and it just registers everything. Uh, in my case, I did it with CDK. Where is my code? I did this with CDK, you saw in a second. So now the question, when to use this? If you use this, you get Quarkus, and you get dependency injection of credentials and S3, so you get you know the entire goodness from Quarkus. But uh, if you're writing an asynchronous function, the cool story is you don't even have to use MicroProfile or Quarkus. You can use a plain Java 11 or 17 function. OK. Questions? Another one. It's not for me. From, mm -hmm. from Johannes. Uh, how about other cloud providers, uh, GCP or Azure? Uh, yeah. Um, Azure, exactly the same. Azure, the code looks exactly the same. Uh, the only difference is there is no Quarkus extension. Uh, I'm using an Azure Maven plugin. And this Azure Maven plugin does exactly the same. The code will be absolutely portable. So, um, so uh, Azure Functions and, uh, and Quarkus I already use in production. Google uh, GCP, not, not yet. But uh, Asia and, 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 and Quarkus is almost identical. Uh, if you search for um, Asia, Microsoft, uh, Maven, this is the funniest thing, uh, Maven, uh, Maven, Asia Functions. Asia Function is the name. And by the way, AWS was the first. And, um, and this is why I refer to AWS. Yeah, this is the... Um, this is the what you, what you have to know. And also, there is a tutorial, Asia Quarkus function, uh, Asia functions Quarkus. Also, Quarkus ships with a small archetype, but it's not well maintained. Or it, 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 yeah, exactly. So you can start an, an archetype with Asia functions, and it will take a look at this. It will, the code, the microprofile code is identical. The only difference is uh, here an, an Asia um, Maven plugin is used. To generate, you know, to, to to deploy, and in the case on AWS, Quarkus generates the function.zip. But uh, you know, the idea is similar. The performance is similar. It's absolutely usable. And uh, the cool story is, we don't have to care about that because we just focus on code, as we did, you know, the last twenty years. Okay, and this is actually next time we can we focus today on this. And the question from Anna was about asynchronous events. We don't have time a lot about this. We focus on that. This is like, you know, how to expose your microservice or Jack synchronous Jack's REST API to the outside world. But the what happens then is if your Lambda stores something to DynamoDB or to S3 or, or to, to another resource, uh, an event in the cloud is generated. And then asynchronous Lambdas, it could be funky or not, are listening to this uh, uh, event and do something with it. Yeah, if you're interested, there are uh, workshops around the corner, but they are almost full. So we are doing the entire day exactly this what I showed you uh, today. Uh, the next one is uh, about serverless Lambda. And then in Ma May, I will prepare you know, the entire CDK infrastructure and we'll walk through the code. Um, yeah, thank you. And uh, I'm open for questions right now. So if you have any questions, so we, uh, we are on time. I think two minutes left. So um, Alex, some criticism at least. You say, you know, I'm, 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 I'm not convinced yet, or something. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, so, uh, having usually uh, having um, existing projects means that uh, mm -hmm. uh, you will have some um, something to migrate. Uh, and uh, how hard will be the migration, uh, or should you migrate or just go with uh, Kubernetes or and something that is mm -hmm. kind of drop-in replacement because uh, Lambda is okay. not like a drop. -in. Okay. Uh, funny stuff. Um, I never used Kubernetes so far in the public cloud, 
and always use Kubernetes on premise. And Kubernetes never directly OpenShift is great. Um, so OpenShift is a great uh, uh, how to call it usability or rancher. Uh, privately in the, on a private cloud or, or on premises in the public cloud for instance uh, if you have a um, java e project which is more complex we go to aws fargate for instance or on asia it's called aci asia container instances or asia app service they are uh, this is like you know what you only need in the cloud is something which starts and stops your containers and have a load balancer kubernetes is more interesting if you have you know your own operators or building a product and Kubernetes is not exactly serverless because in Kubernetes you will have to pay for the control plane the entire time. So in Kubernetes case, you are paying 100 euros per month just for the control planes, roughly. This is like, um, and th there is no workload. You know, then I can already ship two microservices without call starts with on Lambda. Also, what I forgot to mention, Alex, with Lambda in our projects, every developer gets the entire environment. It costs nothing. You, they can create the lambdas, you know, and they cost nothing. But it's really hard to imagine that every developer gets its own, you know, Kubernetes cluster because you have ten developers, then you have already one thousand euro fixed cost for one one environment. So it is it, it is it is a little bit cumbersome, I would say. Right? This is not as there is a, you saw. There is a, mm -hmm. a way to run a, a good Kubernetes cluster with twenty five bucks on Google. Uh, it, it's, uh, yeah, Google uh, is the best. Google is the, the best ergonomics. But if you uh, run, let's say, on AKS, on, a on on AWS Kubernetes, the crazy part is, if you think about this, for me, Kubernetes is a complete cloud. Right? You can run Kubernetes. This is actually, yeah. this would I understand under no running workloads. So then I get Kubernetes on AWS cloud. So I have two clouds. And now as the problem in Kubernetes, you have to maintain the users in Kubernetes and maintain the IAM users on AWS. So uh, this is actually not as easy um, because Kubernetes are complete solutions. So Kubernetes is a complete different story. But I would say if you have no really complicated workloads and you invested in operation CRDs, operators, CRDs, whatever, run Kubernetes. Another interesting story is uh, Payara Cloud. What Payara Cloud did, they say, look, we are the Payara cluster. Come on, Payara Cloud. This now is your time. Exactly. So they implemented uh, the clustering of Payaras on Kubernetes. So the Payara Cloud is Kubernetes operator, but I don't see the uh, Kubernetes. I'm just shipping my war, which is really serverless, and Payara deals with you no know, starting, stopping. I don't care. So this is what I get. But you know, fiddling with Kubernetes directly, it is. I don't know whether you did it. You have to write lots of YAML and uh, and 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 hand charts and and stuff and and. And the question is, you saw how what the alternative is, and if you have the, the possibility, do this. So what do you do? One of my current projects, we're shipping the existing application to AWS Fargate first, and then we'll extract some obvious code to Lambdas more and more. Right? And why? Be yeah. Just because of costs. And by the way, the costs, the largest available AWS uh, Fargate cluster costs you 200 euros a month. Four CPU and thirty-two gigabyte of RAM. So you can whatever you put on the AWS uh, uh, Fargate cluster. Um, this is what what will run for two hundred euros a month. Nice. Okay. Um, so uh, thank you very much for for the time allocated. For